The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey everybody, my name is Shruti Ramanujam and I am a product expert here at Manage Engine. And thank you very much for joining us for today's webinar. We really appreciate the overwhelming response that you guys have given us for today's webinar. Um, so welcome. And today, the topic for today in this webinar, we are going to be discussing what are the five critical incidents in your exchange environment that you need to keep an eye on. Yeah. What critical incidents will help you monitor the security of your exchange environment? So without further ado, let's move uh, into the topic. So what we are going to discuss right now is why this particular topic is relevant. Why do we need to know or why do we rather need to keep an eye on the different um, security aspects of your exchange environment? So the reason is this. Security threats have only increased over the years. Yeah, um, Every year you keep hearing of some kind of security attack or the other that's happening um, to organizations. Like throughout last year we had, throughout last year and this year, we keep hearing about ransomware and uh, organizations being affected by it. There are phishing emails being sent out. So much different, sophisticated kind of viruses that are being spread. Security threats just keep on increasing over the year. And um, yeah, emails are such an easy entry point for cyber attacks because everyone in your organization is going to be using emails. You would have walked in this morning um, just a while ago. And just imagine how many emails have you sent so far? How many emails have you replied to so far? So as you can see, emails are just going to be sent back and forth quite a lot. So emails are such an easy entry point for cyber attacks because hackers know that emails are the weakest link through which they can send malware into your organization. And finally, this topic is relevant because as an exchange administrator, you still need to know how exactly you can ensure security in your exchange environment because um, you know that emails are the weak link. You know that hackers can make use of emails in order to send malicious uh, attachments to your organization's users. So in order to prevent all of this, since you know that these things are happening, in order to prevent it, you need to know what the five critical incidents are that you need to audit in order to ensure that your exchange environment and thereby your entire network is safe and secure. So that is why today's topic is really important. As more people join, I would just like to give you um, a quick uh, introduction. My name is Shruti Ramanujam um, and thank you for joining our webinar. And Throughout this webinar, if you have any issues at all, if you are not able to hear my voice or if the audio is kind of not clear, or even if you just want me to slow down when I'm talking, just make use of the chat box that you see on your screen. And if you have any questions also, you can ask them through the chat box. You do not have to wait for me to finish this webinar because we have Shiva on support. He is going to be manning the chat screen. So any question that you may have while I'm talking, just shoot it out through the chat box that you see on your screen, Shiva will immediately respond to you for any kind of question that you may have. So coming back to today's webinar, uh, we will be discussing what the five critical incidents are that you need to audit in order to secure both your on-prem exchange servers and exchange online. So we'll be looking at that. And in the last five minutes of today's webinar, I will be talking about our product from Manage Engine um, that's called Exchange Reporter Plus. And this product helps you report on, change audit, and monitor your exchange environment. And that includes both your on-prem exchange servers and exchange online. So if you have a hybrid exchange environment, you need to check out Exchange Reporter Plus. So you don't have to worry. This is not going to be too much of a sales pitch because throughout this webinar, I will be 
be keeping it pretty generic. I will just be talking about what kind of threats are out there and how you can protect your organization from such threats. Um, and only towards the end of the webinar, only in the last five minutes, will I be discussing um, Exchange Reporter Plus, how Manage Engine can help you out in securing your exchange environment and also monitoring the health of your exchange environment. So let's jump right into the agenda for today. Um, so these are the five uh, things that you need to ensure are happening properly in your exchange environment. You need to see or you need to ensure rather that there are no unauthorized changes to mailbox permissions in your organization. Um, the second incident or, or, or the second best practice that you can follow is uh, have an efficient patching plan. And do not worry, I will be discussing what kind of patching plan will fit you best. Um, in today's webinar. The third thing that you need to do is identify what kind of threats can occur through using OWA. So now that people are traveling, you could have remote users in your organization, OWA will be used and there are threats that can arise through OWA usage. I'll be getting into that. And then next we will be seeing how you can identify users who are talking to people from external email domains, right? So this could be as simple as talking to a competitor or uh, it could be something malicious. So I will be showing you how you can keep an eye on that and what best practices you can follow in order to ensure that uh, nothing happens to your organization. And finally, we will be seeing how you can identify emails that have malicious attachments because that's one of the easiest ways through which hackers enter your system, right? They send a malicious attachment to an unsuspecting user, they open it and bam, um, your that there is going to be an attack uh, that can happen in your organization. So that is why, um, and, and this is the agenda for today. These are the five topics that we will be uh, discussing today. And as I was saying, that is why Exchange Reporter Plus is something that you will need, but I am not going to be discussing it um, throughout the webinar. We will get to that in the last five to 10 minutes of this webinar. Um, also, I'm, I understand that all of you would be having busy schedules. So this webinar will only be around half an hour to 45 minutes long so I won't take too much of your time um, we can jump right into each of these five tasks or the topics for today and that's it we will be done pretty soon um, so let's start right away to the very first task for today or the very first topic for today which has to do with tracking unauthorized changes to the permissions of important users mailboxes as always let's set the scene Mailboxes are important in any organization, right? I already said it um, right in the beginning of this webinar. I mentioned how as soon as you walk in, you are going to be exchanging emails back and forth in your organization. So mailboxes are really important and right from the lowest level, like an intern in your organization to the highest employee, like the CEO, they are all going to be using emails. And um, in relation, they are also be going to be using uh, mailboxes in your organization. People in your organization are highly dependent on emails. So if your CEO is using his mailbox, he's obviously going to be sending some classified information. He is going to be emailing important confidential information with his peers. So you wouldn't want such information to get into the hands of people you do not trust. Um, so you would want only owners and trusted delegates to have access over this sensitive mailbox information, right? So these owners or trusted delegates, they can have full access or send as permissions. But if it is a rogue user, you wouldn't want the road user to have access to such important information because such an unauthorized user can misuse the mailbox content. So this is definitely something that you do not want happening in your organization and that is why you need to constantly keep an eye on permission changes in your organization. And there are several different scenarios that we can discuss here. And these are all possible scenarios that some of our customers have mentioned have happened in their organization. So the very first scenario has to do with multiple administrators. If you are a large business, if your organization is a large business, you will be familiar with this scenario. Since it's a large business, you must have a big infrastructure team. IT infrastructure team is going to contain a lot of administrators. And when there are many administrators, when there are more than one administrator, 
any administrator is going to make any kind of change whatsoever, right? So it will be difficult for you to identify which administrator made the change. So a, a stream of emails should be exchanged, right? You need to keep sending emails about, okay, he, who did this? Who, who came and made this particular change? In order to find that out, you have to be communicating back and forth before you identify what and who made the change in your organization. So this is a scenario where auditing mailbox permission changes will help you out. The next scenario has to do with rogue users. I already said this, certain mailboxes contain sensitive mailbox information. If there is a rogue user in your organization and this rogue user could be anyone, this could be someone that was suddenly fired one day or, or this is someone who has, uh, who, who generally is malicious and who wants to create problems in your organization. So such a kind of rogue user could go and mess up permissions, right? They, they could gain full access permissions over an important mailbox and then they could leak the classified information that is present in that mailbox, right? They could plan it, they find out what kind of sensitive information is available in which mailbox, they can leak it to a competitor, it could lead to your organization losing an important business deal. And who will be blamed for all of this? It's the system administrator, which is why you need to audit mailbox permission changes. And the final scenario is actually something that will sound really simple, but you wouldn't believe the number of people that actually mentioned this as a problem in their organization. It has to do with naming the people or naming the employees in your organization. So let's say that you have a senior employee named Ram. Right. Um, so this Ram, his name is spelled R-A-M. And then you have an intern whose name is R-A-A-M. Right. There's an extra A. The letter A is repeated uh, twice in the new hire, whereas the senior employee is just R-A-M. And because there's a confusion in the username, uh, when, senior, when the senior employee Ram is supposed to gain access to a particular mailbox, the administrator could get confused and give the intern RAAM Ram access to the important organizational data, right? And this in turn could be someone who is actually um, like a good person who will point out that, hey, so I have access to this random mailbox and I don't know what's going on, so could you look into it? So, so it could be someone who actually points it out or it could end up being a rogue user. So you wouldn't want that, would you? You wouldn't want some random user to gain access to sensitive mailbox content. So in order to avoid this, um, you need to pay close attention to names while you are changing mailbox permissions. So once again, to avoid problems such as these, if you audit mailbox permission changes, you will quickly notice that a different person has gained access uh, to a mailbox, right? Uh, that to an important mailbox. So this is another scenario where auditing permission changes is going to help you out. So I kept saying you need to keep an eye on permission changes, but how exactly do you do that? How? One thing you can do is use the event viewer. So in the event viewer, all you need to do is search for the event 5140, which has to do with uh, permission changes, right? So just uh, go to the event viewer, uh, look up the particular event log, and all the results are going to come up. I mean, it's, it was 5136, I said 5140, but just type in the event um, ID, which is 5136, which is for permission changes. And it is quickly going to list out all the permission changes that happened in your organization. Click on any log that is obtained here and it will show you details right here. That's how you check out all the permission changes that have happened in your organization. And of course, this is just one method. Uh, in addition to this, you can also use PowerShell if you are good at scripting. Uh, you can use the EAC, you can use the event log. There is just different ways through which uh, you can quickly identify permission changes in your organization. Manage Engine also provides Exchange Reporter Plus, which helps you audit permission changes. And it also gives you real-time alerts when a permission change has happened in your organization. But we will get into that later because I promised you that I wouldn't be talking about the product much. So there are some best practices that you can follow uh, when it comes to auditing permission changes in your organization. So the very first thing that you can do is documentation. You always need to document any change that you perform in your exchange environment. I know that this is advice that system administrators are given regularly, but we don't generally follow it that much. But documentation is really important. Any change you do, document it. You sneeze, you document it. Yeah, 
because uh, when you have multiple administrators in your exchange environment, I already gave you a scenario to do with this. Um, so if one administrator is suddenly asked to troubleshoot something, but if he doesn't know that a particular permission change happened in your organization, he's going to be left scratching his head, not knowing what he should do. Whereas if you had documented what change you had made, all he'd need to do is go through what you have written and he will know exactly how the troubleshooting process should go. So this is exactly why you need to document every change that is happening in your organization. You need to document everything that you do in your exchange organization. The next thing you can do, again, has to do with the scenario that I mentioned. Pay close attention to usernames. It's something very simple, but believe me, this happens in organizations. So you don't want to unintentionally give the wrong RAM access to classified business data. And finally, you can use a third party tool such as Exchange Reporter Plus to keep an eye on permission changes. So that's something that you can do. And these are the best practices when it comes to mailbox permission changes. So the next topic is actually a really broad topic. It has to do with patching. I'm going to tell you um, what pro I, I mean, I'm going to tell you what the best practices are when it comes to patching. And I'm also going to generally talk about patching. How, how exactly do patches figure in the exchange environment and what you need to do about patches. So why exactly do you need patches? Missing patches, they can exp uh, expose your exchange environment to several security attacks. So you do not want um, hackers to know that your um, environment is actually vulnerable because if they know that it's vulnerable, they are going to immediately attack it. So you need to keep your servers updated. You need to keep your um, servers updated. And you need to constantly test that they are updated in order to ensure that um, no problems occur in your exchange environment. Um, so that's something that you need to do. Uh, patching in an ideal world. Patching in an ideal world is exactly what I just said. In an ideal world, as soon as an update is released, as soon as a hot fix is released, you will apply it. You will immediately apply it because you um, do not want to expose your exchange environment to security attacks because if the vulnerabilities become published public knowledge because if the hackers know that this exactly is where this organization is going to be vulnerable they will definitely try and attack it so you do not want them to um throw i mean you do not want to inadvertently throw the doors of your environment open so you will apply the patch immediately as soon as it is released but this is just in an ideal world and why exactly am I saying this is just the case for an ideal world? It's because sometimes the patch itself can cause vulnerabilities. And this is definitely something that has happened before. Um, the patch has caused um, problems such as, uh, you know, complete system crashes. It's caused the blue screen of death for some people. And uh, there are a lot of high profile fiascos where patch itself cost vulnerabilities, which is why some companies usually forego patching. They do not patch until, uh, I mean, they don't patch as soon as the update rolls out. They wait and watch to see what happens because the patch itself uh, has been known to break office, right? Uh, it's caused problems in office. It's affected Windows functionality. It's caused system crashes, blue screen of death. I've listed it all here. The patch itself can cause vulnerabilities, which is why some people, uh, which is why I said only ideally, only in an ideal scenario would patches be applied as soon as they are older. So what am I trying to say? Should you patch or should you not patch? What, what exactly am I saying here? So what I'm saying is this, uh, don't ignore any of the patches that are rolled out, any update that's rolled out. Don't just ignore it just because you think that they might cause problems because you applying the patch will cause much less of a problem than you not applying the patch. Because once the vulnerabilities become public knowledge, it's going to be a problem. So don't ignore the update just because you think they might crash your system. Um, I actually have certain workarounds for you. And this is where the name of this topic comes into picture. You need to put in place an efficient patching plan. So what I told you was that patches themselves can cause vulnerabilities, but you need to patch, um, you need to apply patches quite regularly because you don't want hackers to make use of your vulnerabilities. So what exactly do you do? Do you patch or do you not patch? Like I said, don't ignore the updates just because they might cause problems. What you can do is you can test patches before you deploy them. 
many large enterprises actually do this they have protocols in place for testing the patches before they deploy the patches to their entire network however if you belong to a small business i can see you scratching your head because if you have a small business you definitely wouldn't have enough personnel and you will not have enough hardware in order to set up and maintain a test lab environment which is why you need to you actually need to wait and watch that's the approach that you are looking for don't patch immediately you can delay patching for um, maybe a week that's the next slide you can delay patching for maybe a week or two let someone else be the guinea pig and if no other problems emerge in that time you can go ahead and roll out patches to your own meshes so how exactly do you keep an eye on uh, whether the patch itself causes problems so what you can do is you can keep an eye on all the technical websites out there um, and just one week wait for a week Keep an eye on all the forums, community forums and the Microsoft um, forums. See if anyone is suddenly commenting and saying, hey, so I have a problem. I applied this patch and these are all the problems that happened to me. If someone does that, you know that the patch itself is causing vulnerabilities. If no one does it, good for you. You can go ahead and deploy the patch in your entire system. Right? All you need to do is to see that no major problems are mentioned. And you have an added bonus here. If the patch itself has issues, the vendor will immediately issue a new patch. So you don't have to go through all the problem of rolling back the first update and then installing it uh, once again. Like you wouldn't have to uninstall the old patch so that you can install the new one. If you simply wait, the problematic patch will no longer be available. They will give you the actual patch that fixes the vulnerabilities that the first patch had and you can install the patch freshly and you do not have to go through the whole uninstallation process and there are several other best practices that you can follow when it comes to patching in your exchange environment so what you can do is you can read any kind of documentation that is available so docu by documentation i mean any of the microsoft security bulletins any of their kb articles go through all of them because some updates may have certain requirements they may want certain software to be installed before you can apply the fix you may have to disable or enable certain os features uh, in any case um, go through all the security bulletins and the kb articles to ensure that you fully understand what the patch entails the next thing you can do is scan the community forums. See if any problems are mentioned when it comes to patching. I already said this to you. Um, if, if someone has a problem, they will definitely go to the community forums to mention it. So just keep an eye on it. See if someone's saying something. If no one is complaining, go ahead and deploy the patch. And, and scanning community forums also helps you find out if uh, what kind of trends are happening um, because when, when when I say that people say that they have problems with the patch, it could be it ha it could be to do with certain people who have only certain settings enabled. This problem may not happen to everyone who deploys the patch. So keep an eye on the community forums, analyze your need for the patch. Yeah, so this is another important best practice that you need to follow. See if you definitely need the patch. Is the patch a security update? Does it have nothing to do with security? Is it, it does it just fix performance issues or anything? And you need to do this because if it is not a security update, you can check if your systems will be affected in any way. If you uh, do not apply the patch, if it doesn't affect your system in any way, you do not have to deploy the patch. So this is actually something that we use in several things in our uh, life. If something is not broke, you don't fix it, right? So if, if you do not have problems with the patch not being installed, you do not have to waste your time installing the patch because if it is just going to give you some additional features and if you are not going to be using these features, you don't particularly need this particular patch. So that's all. You don't actually um, need to deploy the patch if it is not something that is necessary. So just analyze your need for the patch and decide if you need it or not. And finally, always be prepared to roll back because if the updates themselves are causing problems, you need to be ready to restore your machines to how they were before you applied the patch. Uh, and this should be done with minimum downtime. 
and what is the solution for that you need good regular backups always make sure that your data is backed up backup backup that is very important so ensure that you have current backups ensure that your recovery process um, has been tested you need to test your recovery process and make sure that it works and even if you don't have a full lab environment you can obviously apply the patches first to uh, just certain machines machines that are not very critical that are not production machines so these are all um, certain best practices that you can follow when it comes to patching in your exchange environment the next topic that we are going to discuss today has to do with owa usage outlook web access is obviously very useful for all of us because of how you don't have to be stuck to your desktop all the time so if any of the users in your organization are traveling they don't have to sit at their desktop in order to connect to their mailboxes owa has made life so much easier for most of us but there are certain threats that can arise through owa so owa is primarily used as remote access when not connected to outlook but some organizations even use owa as a primary email client so i don't know if your organization does that but uh, this is something that you need to know in order to ensure that you are prepared to thwart any possible threats that arise through owa usage so the first thing that we are going to be talking about has to do with authentication So OWA has several different methods of authenticating to Exchange. Um, so one type of authentication is your basic credentials, basic username and password, and there's the forms-based authentication. When it comes to forms-based authentication, it is more secure because the username and password is stored as a cookie, and this cookie is deleted when the user logs out, or if a certain amount of time period has passed, then the cookie is deleted. however this also has a problem if the user does not log out or if the user does not close the browser uh, and if another user accesses the cache credentials until the session times out they are going to get access to what the previous user was using they get that because this user hasn't closed the browser because the cookie is still going to be here the second user is going to access the cache credentials session hasn't timed out and this is definitely a security risk and you can actually address this problem because this is a list of best practices i'm going to mention how you can avoid this kind of problem happening you can lower the timeout value lower the timeout value for any client computers that your organization does not own and having a good password plan also helps in avoiding such problems um so always choose forms based authentication timeout value should be a little less so that the first use even if the first user doesn't log out if someone else uses the same browser they will not be able to access the cache credentials because they don't exist because the timeout value has been lowered and finally have a good password plan in place so when it comes to authentication these are the best practices that you can follow the second thing has to do with passwords so this is actually something every administrator knows knows one of the easiest things to crack is web mail's passwords right weak exchange passwords can be easily exploited via the web Uh, and it only takes one password for an attacker to get in and with that one password they can gain access to your mailboxes they can gain access to your public folders they can crack other users mailboxes and why exactly am i saying this so just before this webinar i was actually going through um, several different articles to see how uh, webmail passwords could be exploited and there was one interesting article that i read where they said that email addresses can be easily found off the internet so this is something that we all know if you go uh, you can definitely find out my email address without me telling you just by googling my name right so email addresses are very easy to get because um, and another thing another way through which you can easily get email addresses is this you go to the organization's website you download some documents from the organization's website you can look for user names in the metadata So once you find usernames in the metadata you can create a password list based on minimal research about the company like you you look at the name of the company address any sports team that is local to that particular area right and then you can use a brute force script in order to run your password attack 
and this is why you need to you ask your users to use stronger passwords because passwords are that easy to hack it is as simple as downloading certain documents from your com from a company's website right so you don't want someone to immediately start a brute force attack on your um, organization so in order to stop that there are certain best practices that you can follow in order to ensure that users don't gain access to your exchange environment so educate your users user education is one of the best best practices that you can follow for everything warn your users about what can happen if their password gets hacked tell them what constitutes a stronger password and that's it you that's how you like educate your users give them a best practice guide tell them why exactly they need stronger passwords and then have proper login controls in place so um, ensure that um, login control is um, done properly uh, and also perform penetration tests uh, on the test accounts that you have to see or to simulate a hacking attack, right? So that's what um, you do. And then the next thing, another problem with OWA in addition to authentication and passwords is attachments in OWA. So uh, attachments are one of the biggest security risks when it comes to OWA. Um, so what happens is if a user views an attachment through OWA, they are creating a local copy in their temporary internet files, in their TIFF files. So this copy can be viewed by anyone who has access to the computer. And why is this a problem? This particular user could have been using a public computer. So if I'm an employee in your organization, and if I use a public computer in order to check my email, let's say I'm doing that. And at one point I'm viewing an attachment. It's an important attachment that the CEO has emailed me. I'm, I'm quite gullible, so I just open the attachment and I'm looking at it. And then if someone else uses that public computer, the local copy is already going to be present in the temporary internet files. And this second person is easily going to get access to what my CEO sent me. So you want to avoid that. So in order to avoid that, what you can do is you can make sure that your users um, you know, even if they open file attachments, they should be only of approved file types because information contained in these files can be left behind on the computer's browser cache. So um, this way you can, and, and you must already know of Exchange Server 2007, which helps differentiate between public and private computer use. So what you can do is you can configure separate file access limitations based on the type of computer being used. So if it is a public computer, you can control file access using OWA properties. As you can see, the default website properties are right here. So you can see what kind of pro properties, what you want to enable, what you want to disable, all of that you can see through this dialog box, the OWA properties dialog box is going to help you limit the risk that comes with accessing information through public computers. The next topic that we are going to look at has to do with users communicating with blacklisted email domains. But more importantly, the first thing is that you need to monitor users' email communications. Um, so these uh, these are all the reasons why exactly you need to monitor users communication. You don't want users to misuse office resources. You don't want people to be in during office hours. You don't want them to be using the office email address in order to be communicating with other people. So when I say blacklisted email domain, this could be a direct competitor of your organization. So you don't want the people in your organization to be talking to other um, competitors because if they are talking to other competitors, they are going to be revealing information, um, which is why you need to keep an eye on users talking to external email domains. Another reason why you need to monitor users communication is to identify which users send the most external emails, which users are communicating with external domains a lot. And finally, you can see if employees are forwarding their work emails to their personal email accounts. This is something that people actually do, right? And this is not exactly a security risk, but this is again something that you need to do in order to ensure that important information is not leaving your organization. So that is why you would monitor users email communication. And uh, these are all the and, and in order to have some best practices in place for this. You just educate your users about why they shouldn't be communicating with blacklisted email domains. Um, you can use a third party tool such as Exchange Reporter Plus in order to keep an eye on 
the kind of um, information that is being sent outside the organization. This is actually something that you can do with Exchange Reporter Plus. I will be talking about it in the next task that we're doing, and I will also be um, showing you how exactly Exchange Reporter Plus helps you identify users talking to external email domains. The final topic for today is actually one of the most important topics for today. It has to do with detecting emails that contain malicious attachments. You need to monitor email communications. I said this in the beginning of this webinar and I'm going to keep repeating it. I'm going to like write it down and let you know about it because this is something that is really important. So if you take a look at every single security attack that has happened in organizations so far, you would notice that a common denominator in most of these security attacks is emails. It's usually unsecured emails. It's usually emails that contain malicious attachments. Even WannaCry had to do with people downloading uh, a malicious attachment. There could be some user in your organization who doesn't know that the email is unsecured. They could get an email which actually looks legit, but if they click the attachment, if they download the attachment, it could just um, invite malware into your organization. So this is why you need to monitor email communications. Uh, your users could also be spamming um, other people. You want to avoid that. Um, and as I said in the previous topic, if users are forwarding emails to their personal email accounts, it can cause issues such as compliance issues. It could lead to data loss and so on. When it comes to malicious attachments specifically, Emails are an easy gateway for malware. We already talked about this. So users can just open a malicious attachment. It could cause problems in your organization. So in order to avoid it, you need to make sure that um, you need to make sure that malicious attachments are not being received by your users. Or even if they do receive malicious attachments, you need to make sure that uh, they do not open it. And one main thing, one best practice I'm going to mention here, and I'll be repeating it, of course. Uh, you can educate your users about the kind of malware that can arise through unsecured emails. So before that, I have a particular example to mention to you. In last year, last year in June or July, there was this particular topic that everyone was talking about. Like this happened to a lot of Indian and Chinese organizations. Uh, it was an adware called Fireball. So Fireball is a browser hijacker. So what Fireball would do is it would take control of internet browsers. It would track victims' web usage. It could steal their personal files and so on. If you haven't heard about it, um, Firewall was actually, uh, people who discovered it was actually a cybersecurity firm called Checkpoint. So Checkpoint found out that a, an adware called Firewall was being sent. They also identified that a Chinese firm called Rafotech, which actually helps with creating games, they were the ones who actually initiated Fireball into people's lives. These people were eventually busted. This was in July or something. But Fireball is a virus that they use for advertising fraud. So what they would do is Rafotech had a lot of products. This Chinese firm, they had a lot of products that were, you know, like, like something called a so-so desktop. They had an image viewer. So all these applications, all these products that Rafotech had available, these would all come bundled with a malicious strain of malware. So if some user goes and downloads any of these products, the malware would then install browser plugins. And these plugins would manipulate victims' web browser configurations. It would replace their default search engines and home pages with fake search engines and none of of this was for legitimate purposes. Fireball was able to spy on your web traffic. They were able to track your um, web usage. They were able to keep or, or take control of victims' web browsers. So it just caused a bunch of problems. So in addition to the malware coming bundled with the products of Rafotech, there was another way through which Fireball could get into your system. This was actually more prevalent than the downloading their products Part because they're Rafotech. It's not like some huge company. So it's not like a lot of people are going to be downloading their products. So they had another way through which they were introducing malware into people's systems. What they did was they sent the I mean, what they would do is they would send emails to unsuspecting users. These emails would contain something that looked like a link to PowerPoint files. So it would either contain a link or it contained an attachment. Um, the link would usually end with something like order.ppsx, invoice.ppsx, or so on. 
So one thing you need to notice here is PPSX is not the extension for PowerPoint files. However, if you're just skimming through this, you would immediately look at this and think, oh, okay, so this is probably a PowerPoint file, right? And you don't even have to click on the link. Without clicking on the link, even if you just hover your mouse over the link, it would download the adware into your system. These emails usually had a subject line such as purchase orders, confirmation. Like these are all normal sounding uh, subject lines. When you see a subject line such as this, you will immediately assume that there is something important. You will open the email, hover your mouse over the link and the PowerPoint file or, or the malware essentially got downloaded into your system. Which is why you need to have certain best practices in place in your exchange environment. You need to make sure that you um, keep your systems patched. You need to ensure that patches are immediately applied. We had we dedicated an entire topic to this um, particular best practice. You need to use a filtering tool in order to avoid phishing emails. So I just came back from writing a document as a product marketer here at Manage Engine. I generally um, write other documents too. We, I write our marketing materials. Uh, so one thing that I was writing about right now had to do with the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service in the United States. So what is happening in the US right now um, is that after tax season, a lot of people started receiving emails that said your tax refund, right? The subject line would be something as simple as your tax refund. You'll think it's from the IRS. You will open the email and it would essentially be a phishing email. It wasn't a legitimate email from the IRS, which is actually the government. So people sent phishing emails posing as the government. How awful is that? So in order to prevent all of that, you can actually use a filtering tool so that you can avoid phishing emails. Educate your employees. That's the final best practice that I'm going to give you for the day. Tell your employees what can happen if there is lax email security. Educate them about email security. Tell them about phishing scams. Give them examples of how exactly a phishing email would look because you can actually tell they, they wouldn't have correct grammar. Phishing emails um, might look legitimate, but they're not actually legitimate. If they get an email from an unknown user and if it contains an attachment, do not download the attachment. So these are all best practices that you can mention to your um, end users in order to ensure that they do not turn a blind eye to email security. So educate them about all of these. And these are all ways through which you can protect yourself from adware such as the firewall adware. And finally, what I've been talking about since the beginning of this webinar, we are going to be talking about Exchange Reporter Plus. So Exchange Reporter Plus is um, Exchange Reporter Plus is actually a reporting, change, auditing, and monitoring tool. It's for your Exchange environment, and this includes both your on-prem Exchange servers and Exchange Online. And one thing that you need to remember here uh, is that this is going to help you even if you have a hybrid exchange environment. If you've already moved to the cloud or if you're planning on moving to the cloud, Exchange Reporter Plus has still got your back. So this product is mainly a reporting tool. So it contains around 300 unique reports. It helps you audit various aspects of your exchange organization. It also helps you monitor the health of your exchange servers. And one more thing, we want to make this a, an, an all-round messaging tool. So in a few weeks time, we will also start supporting Skype for Business. So we will also help you report on and monitor Skype for Business in your um, organization. So this is essentially going to help you out with managing your entire messaging system. Another thing that Exchange Reporter Plus provides is real-time alerts. With these real-time alerts, you can ensure that nothing critical happens in your organization. So I'll give you a quick demo of the product. Uh, it will take just five minutes of your time. I've switched to the product screen. So this is the product. I'll click on login. So Exchange Reporter Plus is going to have certain main tabs. Oops. Um, this has been open for a long time, so I'm assuming that's the timeout, but uh, I've clicked login. Anyway, so there are three main tasks that Exchange Reporter Plus does. They are reporting, auditing, and monitoring. So they are the three main tabs right here. And then we have a whole new tab called Exchange Online. If you were wondering why Exchange Online is separate from these three main tasks, is because we wanted to give or dedicate a separate area for your uh, cloud 
environment right so exchange online is in a particular uh, different tab all you'll need to do is click on the tab and look at the functionalities that we have for exchange online so as soon as you log into exchange reporter plus you are welcomed by the dashboard so it contains a lot of important information and this is all listed in the form of easy to understand graphs so it shows you any critical alert that has been generated at the top of the screen it shows you the server storage usage. You can see the top mailboxes in your organization based on size. And one more thing, in addition to reports on the top mailboxes, Exchange Reporter Plus also gives you an alert. So if there are important um, executives mailboxes that reach their size limits, Exchange Reporter Plus will immediately give you an alert so that you notice that certain mailboxes have reached their size limits. In addition to this, you can also monitor the organizational traffic. You can see the top server traffic, that is the server and the number of messages that the server received or sent. Um, so a lot of information in the form of bar graphs, pie charts and tables are present here. And at the right hand side of the screen, you have quick links. You can click on any link and it will immediately take you to a report. So you don't have to navigate through the main tabs present here. Click on a link if you want to look at mailbox enabled users you just need to click on this particular link it'll take you to the report that you are looking for so these are three main tabs if you look at the reporting tab it is going to give you insights about the most important parts of your exchange environment so this includes your mailboxes owa and active sync email traffic public folders and we also have compliance reports exchange reporter plus helps you comply with SOX, hipaa pci glba and the gdpr so these are all the things that erp exchange reporter plus helps you comply with so you can just come here uh, to find the information that you need you can send it to your auditors you can schedule it to be sent to your auditors and so on and that's how you ensure that you stay compliant OWA and ActiveSync because we were talking about OWA in our webinar today. This is something that you can look at. Log on failure through OWA can be easily checked out using Exchange Reporter Plus. When it comes to ActiveSync, you can easily identify any of the inactive ActiveSync devices because if there are still going to be mobile device connections floating around in the air, when users are not exactly using those devices, you can check it using this particular report. Under email traffic, I was talking about how you need to monitor uh, users communicating with external email domains. We have reports for that available here. All you'll need to do is click on the report and it's going to show you which user was communicating with which external domain. And then we have the auditing tab. Um, and in the auditing tab, you get important information such as mailbox permission changes, which is again something that we discussed earlier. So this report is going to show you every kind of permission change that happened in your organization based on the period that you set here. So today there is no data found because today no permission change has happened in this test organization that I am using. So I'll go back to the last 30 days in order to see what permission changes happened. This report immediately shows me which user made the change on which mailbox was the change made. What was the name of the server? What time did this happen at? Which attribute was modified? And it gives remarks such as how many access control entries were added or removed. It shows you the new value and it shows you the old value. So in addition to this, the auditing tab gives you several other information. You can check out which non-owners are accessing a particular mailbox. You can check out any changes to the mailbox storage quota. If any mail exchange database is suddenly dismounted, you can take a look at this report to see it. And you can also generate a real time. You can also get a real time alert when a particular database has been dismounted. So some of the things that we discussed can be easily done using Exchange Reporter Plus. Uh, the monitoring tab would essentially just show you the health of the different exchange servers in your organization. But I'm not going to go into detail into it because we, uh, we have generally focused on the security aspects of Exchange today. So I'll show you how Exchange Reporter Plus helps you secure that. And for this, I'm going to show you just one feature of Exchange Reporter Plus, which I believe is the strongest feature of Exchange Reporter Plus. It has to do with the last topic that we looked at today. How do you identify malicious attachments being sent uh, by users? How do you how do you know if someone is suddenly sending an email um, that has a malicious attachment attached to it? 
so what you can do is you have a report called um, the content report um, I mean you have several reports available here the report that we are looking for is the messages by subject keyword report and I'm mentioning this one specifically because I was telling you how um, yeah fireball had um, a subject line such as this right um, so so fireball would usually come with a legitimate looking subject line such as purchase orders or confirmation or something so I'm going to show you how exchange reporter plus would help you detect which users um, had these particular uh, emails or which user received an email which contained this as the subject line so we already have a report this is a test report but I will show you how you can customize the report um, essentially this report is going to show you the name of the mailbox the folder name which folder is this email present in what is the subject of the message who sent the message who received the message when was the message received what is the size of the message and if there is an attachment what is the name of the attachment and what is the size of the attachment so that's what this report is going to show but that's not what we are going to talk about so let me just show you how you can customize a report so that you can detect which emails contain this as their subject line. So there's a button right here at the top right corner of the screen. It's called create new report. All you need to do is create a new report and mention what kind of subject line you want to filter emails based on. So I'm going to call the report name as um, messages with confirmation in the I mean it's purchase orders right purchase order in the subject line so that's going to be the name of the report select the report type for which report do you want to customize it you're essentially going to customize the report to be run for a particular uh, filter so since we're going to be searching through the emails in my organization let's call it uh, it's actually the mail search report type at the mailboxes which you want to filter through I'm going to select all the mailboxes because I want to see any user who's received this particular uh, email in their organization and then the filters are present here what date range do you want to look at I want to look at all like since the beginning of time folder name do you want to check just a particular folder or can you check all the folders I don't want a specific folder so I'm just going to look through all the folders present here right and then next what you can do is okay let's just select the inbox alone this is not going away hold on just give me a minute Okay, so this drop down wouldn't go away for me. Uh, but anyway, so select the folder name for which this wants to be done. I'm just going to check the inbox of a particular user. Uh, choose the keywords. So where do you want the keywords to be present? As I told you in Fireball, it contains a particular uh, keyword in the subject line. So I'm going to isolate the messages based on the message subject. But I can also do it based on the content in the body of the message. I can do it based on the attachment file name or the attachment file extension. Let's go with message subject. What do I want the subject to contain? I want the subject to contain this, right? I just copied it. Um, let's come here and this is the subject line so if any report or if any email in my organization has this particular keyword in their subject line this exchange reporter plus is immediately going to let me know it will immediately give me um, I mean it will immediately show me in the report if there are um, any emails that contain this as the subject line if you want you can also filter based on the attachment but I'm gonna forego that just click create and it's going to be created right so um, what's gonna happen now is a new report is going to be created uh, called what exactly we named it right this is the new report that's been created messages with purchase order it won't have data because it's actually gathering data right now but it should be done in a few minutes so in a few minutes this report will show me if there are any emails in my organization that contain that particular report in their subject line but uh, that's beyond the period that we have allocated for this webinar but that's how this works 
So in addition to this, there are several other things that Exchange Reporter Plus does. You can check out all the number of messages and the size of the messages present in your Exchange organization. You can locate messages based on keywords in the body of the message or based on the name of the attachment, the extension of the attachment, the size of the attachment and so on. Um, we also have the Exchange Online tab and once again, you can audit various different aspects of your Exchange Online environment using the reports that are available under this tab. So if you have a cloud environment, if you have a hybrid Exchange environment, you have nothing to worry about. All you need to do is go to the Exchange Online tab, configure an Office 365 tenant and you will be ready to audit different aspects of your Exchange Online environment. So these are all the different things that Exchange Reporter Plus does. Um, I actually kept it really brief and I didn't explain everything that the product actually does because I wanted to focus on just the security aspects of Exchange Reporter Plus. But if you want to know about the product more, you can always contact me. You can reach out to me at shruti at manageengine.com. Um, I will put you in touch with one of our product experts. One of us will uh, definitely walk you through the product. We will give you a personalized demo. You can actually contact me and tell me what problem you have going on in your organization. Um, tell me exactly what your pain points are and I will tell you how Exchange Reporter Plus would work out for you. So we actually tailor all our demos to fit what you require. So all you need to do is tell us what your problems are. Do tell us so that even in the next webinar, we can actually bring them up as examples. So. That's all for today's webinar. Uh, we discussed the five critical incidents that you need to keep an eye on in order to ensure that your exchange environment is safe and secure. Um, I hope that you found these topics useful um, and I hope that you were able to gain something of value from today's webinar because we actually spent around 50 minutes going over the five critical incidents and I also gave you a quick demo of our tool. Um, so thank you very much. You've actually been a great audience today. Uh, so thank you so much for that. And also thank you for the time you took out of your busy schedules in order to attend today's webinar. So I hope that the time you spent was actually valuable. It was actually useful. Um, so thank you. And I hope you have a great day today.